Welcome to the She's Bold Podcast. I'm Beth Whitman. Hello, and welcome back to another episode of the She's Bold Podcast. As you may know, over these past couple of months, the podcast has taken a bit of a departure from my usual long form in person conversations with guests. Instead, I've been addressing different aspects of dealing with this pandemic and recording remotely, of course, episodes that are a bit shorter. If you go back, you can hear how to be happy during a pandemic, how to stay fit, how to journal, how to boost your immune system, all kinds of useful info to help you get through this trying time. This week is yet another slight departure. You'll recall that a few weeks ago, I shared a Q&A about travel that was recorded with my, quote unquote, my tour people via Zoom. I invited past and future Wander Tours participants to join me so that I could answer their questions about travel. Well, I had a second call with these tour folks, a different group, some little bit of overlap, but uh, a lot of new people on that call. And that happened on May 5th. And I wanted to share that conversation here as well. In this Q&A session, I start out by giving some behind the scenes info about how things work with Wander Tours and why the company is in such good financial health. We also talked about what might happen if a person were to get stuck at a destination. We talked about the best time to purchase travel insurance. And there was even a question about my races that I was to run this year. Some of them, hopefully, I still am running. But uh, I, I go into my approach about those races and how we all might consider approaching our circumstances right now. Oh, one side note here. At one point, I got disconnected from the call, and you'll hear me pop in to let you know exactly what's going on. Uh, It'll make more sense when you hear it. Okay, I'll make this introduction brief so we can dive right into today's episode. Please enjoy this Q&A that is all about travel. Yeah, well, I'm working on a culinary tour for next year, and I think it's going to have to be dramatically different. (laughs) Than, than previous ones. Yeah. You know, kind of the future of travel is is uh, is going to be that way. I think things are going to be uncertain, even as I plan for trips for next year. You know, companies are going under and places are shutting temporarily and permanently. So it'll be kind of interesting to see how things unfold, um, not only for wander tours, but, you know, for other for other companies as well as we, as we plan. So thanks for the introductions there. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to start out by just giving you a little bit of background, but I think it's really important for the community to kind of understand what's happening with Wander Tours and kind of how I run the business so that you so that you can feel more confident in uh, in your choice and and how we're moving forward and through things. So first I'll just say that financially I and Wander Tours are in great shape. I run the company probably a little bit differently than many other companies do and many other tour companies. And it's just, I think part of that is just a factor that Wander Tours is relatively small. It's a small boutique tour company, right? And what happens, it's actually a law in Washington state that when you accept funds from an individual for a tour, it actually has to go into what's called a trust account. Think of it like escrow. So it goes into an account that technically I cannot touch. And what happens is the money comes in and then that money gets paid out to vendors for the tour. So you can have some confidence to know that your money is safe. And if at any point you say, you know what, I want to cancel and I want my money back or a partial deposit or whatever it is, that money is going to be there. It's not going to have been spent. So because of that protection, it's brilliant. You know, it it is a really great law uh, here in Washington state. And like, like I said, it's, that's not the case across every state, but you know, in retrospect, It's a wonderful way to do business because I think some companies are finding themselves in a position right now where they're scratching their heads and they're saying, what's an escrow account that you speak of? I have no idea what this is. 
and um, they're in some financial trouble as a result of that. So because of that, because of this escrow account, any money that you have paid me, you're, you know, we're all good in terms of that. I also run the business financially very conservatively. And there's always a, there's a business account that has finances in it. And I could float the business just from those, from that business account for a while and not have to worry about anything. And, you know, none of us, like the, the big word of the day is going to be like uncertainty. <laughs> like nobody really knows what is going on and kind of what the future is going to bring. But I'm not, financially, I'm not concerned about it. You know, I'm, I'm more concerned about, like I said before, it's difficult now to, to plan for 2021. Uh, like I, 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 when this thing first started to kind of come down, I thought, I thought, oh, great, I'm going to have some downtime to actually plan for tours for next year. And what I found was that nobody was responding to my calls and my emails because they're all shut. And like, as an example, I haven't been able to get pricing or date confirmations from uh, like my folks in Santa Fe. And I need to make some tweaks to the New Orleans tour, which is technically on the website uh, I mean, it's like literally on the website, ready for people, but I'm, I need to make some tweaks and I can't get answers from people, you know, to confirm those, those minor changes on that. So it'll be interesting to see kind of how things, you know, unfold. And, and really what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to use my time to prepare for an opening down the road. So I just want to, I just want to know that I've got things in place so that when things do open up, and I mean that literally in terms of the, like in terms of hotels, and then I mean it more in the big picture when we're actually able to travel again, I just want to be prepared for that. So that's kind of where, where I'm thinking. And, and Teresa knows we're still doing a lot of back and forth. I mean, certainly not as much as we were, <laughs> But we're still doing quite a bit of back and forth and running things by each other and itineraries and that sort of thing and ideas. So, um, so things are still kind of moving along in terms of that. I get a lot of emails from people who are concerned about the financial hit and kind of con concerned about wander tours in general and me personally, but, you know, just kind of they're very empathetic about what's going on, like in terms of the tour business. And really, this could not have happened at a better time. And it's because I have fewer tours that I'm offering this year because I had a lot of personal travel scheduled. As some of you may know, I was and am scheduled to run a bunch of marathons this year, a bunch of big stage races. So I would be just returning back from Namibia, I think, today, um, having run across the Namib Desert last week, 250 kilometers. And that trip got postponed. I've got another one to the Gobi in Mongolia that's set up for June. And I haven't heard officially that it's canceled or postponed, but I expect I'm every time I open my email, I'm just waiting for that email to come through mm -hmm. and waiting for that change. And then I've got other trips uh, to the Atacama in Chile in September, and then Antarctica in November. And because of that, because I had made space for my own personal travel, I wasn't offering as many tours this year. So that kind of saved me in a way that I didn't have, let's say, the usual culinary trips planned for like May and June. If I did, then I would be scrambling and worried about having to issue refunds to people or reschedule people for next year because the tour was completely canceled. And it would have been at a time when I would have paid all of my vendors. So that's the real key is that if you're a tour operator and you have taken your money from people and then you've paid your vendors but then you can't travel, it's hard to get that money back. In some cases, you may not be able to. So it's a lot of scrambling and having to reschedule things. It kind of fell in this window when I didn't have any of that going on. So that is a really saving grace for me, for sure. Does that all make sense to you all? Am I going into too much? No, it's good. <laughs> yeah, it makes too, much, sense. too much background. I really feel like, like you guys, you guys, and trust me with your money. I feel like I owe you, you know, just kind of an explanation of how it all works. And I think that's really important in the relationship. 
so that's why I'm that's why I'm giving you kind of this background on it. And I will say, like having said all of that, Katie knows that I just had to cancel slash postpone the 2020 Papua New Guinea tour that's scheduled for August. And Katie is scheduled for that trip, and um, she's been kind enough to to move that to you know accept the terms and say yeah just move my deposit over to 2021 and I'll join you then then and you know she had such a sweet response to it that she's just like it'll just be like I'm just something to look forward to next year which I, which I just thought was so great so uh so that's the that's that is kind of the first hopefully it is the last time that I'll have to move or you know cancel kind of shift something Papua New Guinea was a little bit of a special case and I, I'm going to tell you why so first of all, it's a developing country. And for those of you who've been with me, you know, you know, just how much it is, how much of a developing country it is. They have no, really no healthcare system there. That's why when we run the, the PNG tour, we highly recommend, we may even require evacuation insurance for that. Because if something happens, uh, you do not want to be treated in a, in a hospital there. We really need to get you uh, to Australia at the very least. So if we got into the country and something happened, you know, if there was an outbreak, it just would be really difficult to do like a mass evacuation of getting people out of the country. So that's kind of the, that's the one part about it. So that's kind of the first part of it is me kind of of watching out for the, the tour people who are going with me. And then the other aspect of it is, you know, think of, you know, think of the people of PNG very similar to like the people of the Amazon, where you hear about these first contacts or Native American tribes here in the U.S. You know, if a virus, if an illness, if a flu or a cold, they just, they have no immunity. So right now, the number of cases of, of the virus in PNG is very low. It's about eight, so they say although they don't have widespread testing, but no one's died. I just I couldn't live with myself if we were responsible for bringing that into, into the country, especially with these really big events where thousands of people come from all over the country and then they disperse and they go back to their villages. You know, it, it just would have the potential of wiping out villages. Um, and I just, I can't, I can't take that risk. So until we have an answer, and we'll talk about that in a bit, until we have some sort of an answer, I just couldn't, I couldn't take that risk. I, I was hoping that the show committee for this big event that, we're, that we attend, that they would cancel the, the show and they would just make some effort or reschedule it. And they just did not. And I just felt like I needed to make a statement and say, you know what, this is, we're going to cancel. We hope that you'll take the lead on this and make the right decision in canceling it and not encouraging people to travel there. So, so that's Papua New Guinea. Morocco is in October. It's also in February. And then Gujarat, India is in March. So I still have these tours lined up and I'm in very close contact with my operators who are working on these, uh, you know, helping me with these tours and the feedback that I'm getting from them is that they are they're taking it month by month, and um, and I really think that that's just the best approach at this point because things do change on a daily basis. I mean, we're just getting different information, you know, every day about what works and what isn't working, and what testing is available and what's not available and where it's available. So as this unfolds and as testing gets better and as we get closer to a vaccine or we understand a little bit better what's happening with the vaccine, you know, at this point, I I plan to move ahead with those tours until I read something or hear something or know something other than that that just doesn't, doesn't make sense in terms of those tours. Um, so I know some of you are on those trips. Do you have, is there anybody that has any questions at all about it, about any of those tours? No. Beth, can you just, just really briefly tell people, uh, I don't think you mentioned this about Papua New Guinea, the reason they're not canceling the festivals on their end, just because of their financial situation, maybe? No, actually, I don't know that. I don't, I don't know why they're not canceling it. Um, the only thing that I know ab- about Papua New Guinea is that they have, that the show committee has a meeting scheduled for the end of May, and that that's when they were planning to make the decision. And I just felt like waiting 
I felt like waiting that long didn't really make sense because I just wanted my people to know in advance, like have a little bit more advanced warning, just like not be sitting on the fence about it. So I wanted some kind of a definitive answer about it. But I also think, especially because of what I've read about how this is just ravaging the Native American community here in the States. I just felt like that could so easily happen in Papua New Guinea that I, that I needed to make that decision. There's no international flights going into PNG right now. The domestic flights just opened up maybe a week ago, but even those, you need special documentation in order to travel from one area to another. So no one can even book flights at this point. So it's all, you know, it's just all so up in the air. You know, I will say like writing the email to my contact, my tour operator in Papua New Guinea was probably the hardest email I have ever had to write because I know how much he relies on my business, as small as it is. And Mark, you you met Pim. Yep. Deb, you met Pim up in Mount Hagen. Yep. yep. You know, I just, he's family to me. And just to think that he is not, that, that, that they haven't had business in months and that, you know, my small group is one of his biggest, biggest revenue streams for the year just kills me. And I, you know, I checked in with him and I said, Pim, you know, like, do you guys have food? Do you, do you need anything? Can I pay you in advance for next year? You know, what, what can I do to help you? He said, you know, the gardens, you know, how it, how fertile it is up in Mountain Hog. And he said, they're living off their gardens right now, eating a lot of sweet potatoes, but for now they're okay. But the people in the CPIC don't have access to things. So it's that, it's that kind of thing. When I, when I think about how this is affecting our guides and our tour operators and the folks on the ground, it just, I mean, it really just, it, that breaks my heart more than anything because, I mean, you, you have all met guides that you fall in love with, you know, and when you think that their income has just evaporated, you know, and they rely on the hundreds, if not thousands of dollars, whatever that they might make in tips, like that that's what feeds their family. It's just, uh, you know, just kills me. So, Teresa, I don't know if I ended up answering your question at all. You were asking about them canceling the the show, and I just don't, I just don't know. Yeah. You got to what I was asking. So, okay, okay. Anyway, any other questions at all about that, Beth? Are your tour operators in country are they faring pretty well with all this? Because I know you've been working with a lot of them for for quite a few years now. Yeah. So, thank you for asking that. So I'm going to say that they're probably doing okay. The one that I'm most concerned about, as I said, is my one in PNG because they are like, they just don't, they don't have a lot of tourism to begin with in the country. And so the, the, the money that does come in, even from like one group, a group of 10 or 15 people that I might bring in is a, is a really big deal to them. And they're, and they're probably the smallest outfitter of anyone that I work with. So that's, I think that probably deals the biggest blow to them. So the actual tour operators, I think the other, the other ones that I work with are a little bit bigger outfits and probably have a better infrastructure in place. But again, it's a, it's, it, then it trickles down to the guides and just how the, how the guides are affected, you know, because those guides, they don't have bank accounts and, you know, they don't learn to save money. They don't have a system, you know, like we do with unemployment that is going to them then support them. So there's that whole aspect of it too, that, you know, that, that these folks are really going to be struggling. I have thought about, I don't, I don't have a, I don't have a way to do this and I haven't I haven't sat down and really kind of thought around uh, thought about a structure around it but I have thought about like doing a GoFundMe page where I would ask my tour people to help fund you know help a fund that would then be distributed to these guides you know just to help support them in in this uh very off season <laughs> you know this time for now, like I said, I'm just kind of dealing with the with the folks in PNG and trying to get get some money to them to help support them through this, and then and then probably we'll look at uh, ways to support the the tour guides that uh, that are making absolutely no money right now. Mm-hmm. Did that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. Keep us posted if you do 
find a way to, to help support or get any feedback on that. Okay. Yep. I sure will. And then what I'll do is I'm just going to move on to some questions that people had sent in. Uh, you know what? I'm just going to start with Mary here. Mary had asked, she had sent me via email a question and asked, when will it be safe to fly again? <laughs> I mean, Good question. But Pardon? even domestically. Well, you know, I would say that, like some people might say that it's perfectly safe to fly now using proper precautions. Like I just got a, an email today from Delta that outlined their new policies and mm. they're flying at 50% on their flights. They're requiring masks for everyone. And then they're taking special precautions, special cleaning precautions. I think, you know, ultimately anything that we do from walking down the street, going to the grocery store or taking a trip, be it on a subway or a train or flying, we all have to determine one, what is our comfort level? Like, you know, what, what are we going to be comfortable with? My poor nephew in New Jersey and <laughs> my nephew in, in Caldwell and uh, his fiance in Bloomfield, they haven't seen each other in seven weeks. They're supposed to get married. They had to sign a marriage license yesterday and they both showed up in masks and it was the first time they'd seen each other in seven weeks. Wow. So, I mean, so you have people that are, I'm not saying that it's right or wrong. I'm saying it's just sad for them. But you have people who are more at that extreme level. And then, I mean, quite frankly, you have people like me who go out for a morning run, you know, every day. And um, sure, I'm, you know, running down the middle of the street or I'm, because there's no cars or I'm, you know, definitely avoiding people. But I'm, I am, I'm not, I'm not as, uh, I'm not as paranoid. And, and again, I don't want to make a negative connotation around that. I'm just not, I'm not taking those extreme measures. I heard a, a friend of mine, she said she hasn't had a fresh vegetable in two months because she's afraid to go to the store for fresh, fresh vegetables. So it just depends on your, on your comfort level. Um, like I said, I think safe to fly again is going to mean different things to different people. Some people may not want to fly for, for a year and a half when there's a vaccine. And then, and then they know that every person who's getting on the flight is vaccinated, right? Or has the antibodies and we know that it can't be, they can't be reinfected or something. I think that one thing that might happen in the future is that we are issued, if you, if, you know, international travelers, hopefully you have one of these already, the yellow health card. Mm -hmm. And I think that somewhere down the road, we are going to be required to have a health card or a health passport or that it'll go in that yellow health card and it will show that we've been vaccinated or that we have had an antibody test and that we have had the virus and that we can't get reinfected if that if they do find that out or they do figure that out. I think that is a way that we can feel safe about it ourselves. So does that answer your question, Mary? It does. Yeah, it does. Definitely. I don't, I mean, right now, I, I, I it's almost like, it's so hard to answer any questions right now, to be honest with you. I mean, it's good to kind of hash things out and to talk them out and to hear what other people have to say and think about it. But because things change every day, I mean, it is like, it is so hard for me to send a newsletter out because I'll write something one day and then the next day there'll be a different news report out or I'll feel a different way. And I think, oh gosh, well, what I wrote yesterday doesn't even make sense anymore. Do I really want to put this out there in the world? Because it just things are just changing mm -hmm. so quickly. So I think I think just it's gonna be time is you know, it's gonna things are gonna unfold and time is gonna tell. Mark, I'm gonna go on to your question here. And uh, what you had said was that you can imagine possibly in the future, whether that's in a year or a year and a half or whenever it is, um, when there's a mass produced vaccine. So we have availability of a vaccine, let's say, in that, in that future world. But then there's a flare up of the virus somewhere and there's a hot spot. Let's say it's in New York, right? What, what's going to happen there? What's going to happen if there's a, a lockdown and we either get caught traveling in that location, you know, let's, let's hope that it's Fiji. <laughs> let's, let's hope that we get stuck in Fiji or, you know, and, and not in Papua New Guinea. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, so what happens in those cases? And that's, I think that's, 
Well, I think it, it might be similar to what, what happened, you know, six weeks ago is that people got caught in certain countries and then they had to scramble to get out. And, um, and I'm not up to speed on this, but on our last Zoom call with everybody, a couple of people had mentioned that, yeah, there's people that are still stuck in Ecuador, I believe, Peru. And I'm, I'm sure there's people stuck all over the world that they can't get out because they can't get out on flights. And, and our embassy has, has stepped in, you know, to try to help out. But there are still people who are stuck in different parts of the world. And I mean, that's just a reality of it at this point. To kind of jump into some other questions that have come up about insurance. I've noticed that some insurance providers are now actually putting the word pandemic into their language. So it's very clear that they will not cover you in the case of a pandemic. So that's just something to be aware of. But I I think that I, I actually don't know. Does anybody know anyone who's been caught in a country and they've had to either pay their way out or you yeah. know, purchase a ticket. Who said that? Yeah, I did. Oh, yeah. So what happened, Deb? They were stuck in Cuba. Ooh. And they're actually a tour, a husband and wife that we've gone on a lot of tours with. And we were just in Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia with them. And right when we were coming home, China was closed off. We couldn't go to some places in Cambodia. They were starting to, we really had to get out of there. So we did. They flew to Cuba the husband and wife team. And then they tried to get home to to Canada and Cuba was stopping the flights. They couldn't go. And they got the last Sunwing flight and they're from Victoria, which is on the West coast of Canada. They are still in Dartmouth, Nova Scotia right now. The only place they could get out to and get in back into Canada was on the East in Nova Scotia. And they're still there. So, and they have a lot of travel techie knowledge and they were trying their hardest to get here and everywhere, but they just needed to get home. Yeah. They could get home to Canada at the end. They weren't being picky and they're fine back there. I don't know when they're going to try and get out to this side of Canada, but it was the last plane they got on was the Sunwing tour. And, you know, Sunwing gave them it a free, they couldn't believe it that they gave them a free ticket home. Yeah, I think actually maybe Teresa, do you recall uh, was there someone on the on the last call that talked about somebody having to pay to get out and it was quite expensive? I can't remember what the destination was. Yeah, that was the person that was either Ecuador or Peru that you mentioned. I have a friend who's right now who's a singer and entertainer on a ship and she she and her husband are still stuck on the ship um in Miami. They will not let her off cuz she's from New York. And they left, you know, they let the guests off, but a lot of the entertainment are still stuck. And there's like 34, this is day 40 or whatnot. Oh, and geez. She doesn't know what she's going to do. So she is somewhat freaking out. That's terrible. Yes. And I have a friend um, who's working in the Dominican Republic who's Guatemalan. And they closed the borders in Guatemala. So she couldn't go back to Guatemala. And she didn't want to stay in the DR because of health care. So she actually happened to have a, she just got a visa a couple months ago to come to the U.S. So she's here with some of our friends now, but she can't go home until they open the borders to Guatemala, even though she's Guatemalan citizen. Yeah. So we've seen that a lot of countries. I just noticed today India is allowing for the first time flights of uh, Indians who were stuck abroad to go back in. And Mm. I have a friend whose son is in college and he's a senior and he's um, from New Delhi and he's been staying here in the U.S. He hasn't been able to go home. They're yeah. going to start thinking about moving people around a little bit more. And I think it's a, I think it's a good point. It's like it's, I think it's going to be up to the discretion of the airlines, maybe, whether they charge, right, or whether they charge double. <laughs> and then I think that the U.S. embassy hasn't – like I had read early on that the embassy was working to get people out of countries and back home, back to the U.S., but I think that hasn't that had that hasn't worked obviously for everybody. Uh, I think Mark, like just back to your question, I, I think it's going to be on a case by case basis, and depending on the on the hot spot, you know, if it flares up again, it's going to depend on the hot spot um, and uh, how on it's the handled. The flip side, if the hot spot's where you're coming from, and you don't want to go and risk infecting the world where you're going, sort of the other side of that. Right. Yeah. True. And I think that's where the yeah, I don't even I don't even know. I mean, it's just like there you know, there's endless possibilities of how it might play out whether you whether you stay in quarantine where you are and then you're 
traveling with mask and gloves, you know, to get back to your destination, whether they will even allow you back. I think it's, I, I just, I think it's really hard to tell. I think prepare for anything mentally. I think it, you know, I think it's mentally preparing for, for the possibility of, of anything until, until we do get kind of a mass vaccination. And I mean, you, I think that it could be, it could be said, the same thing could be said of polio or, or other, other things where there's a vaccination, yet there's hot spots that, that break out in certain countries too. You know, like yellow fever is one where you can't go to certain countries unless you've had a, it, it, like if you've been to a country where yellow fever has occurred, you can't get to another country unless you have like the vaccination for it and you show proof of that. So it might come to that. Did somebody else have a question? Before I have to go, I wanted to know how you're doing with your training for these three (laughs) huge races you're in. (laughs) My training... I am I am still training. So these events that I'm doing, they are they're called stage races. They're over 7 days and it's 250 kilometers running across four different deserts in the world. And as I mentioned, Namibia, I should have done Namibia last week. So what happened was I've been training for that for the last whatever year and then when I heard that that was being rescheduled then I just shifted and I shifted my training schedule and I then I figured out what I should be doing to run the Gobi in June and now I know that that one's going to crumble but I'm still training I'm kind of using it as an opportunity to increase my base you know just to get a little bit faster I went to the track today and I was running intervals and doing some biking I can't do any swimming of course right now but uh, I'm still training and and doing what I can I'm Wednesday mornings I get on a zoom call at five o'clock in the morning with people that are also doing the desert races and they're from around the world so I have to get up at 4.30 4.30 and jump on that call to work out. So, oh, that's just, awesome. you know, I just, I, I will say just like in, in that perspective, just in terms of like working toward a race, whether it's a marathon or, or whatever, these other crazy events, or whether it's traveling in some ways, like we have to act as if, you know, we have to have hope. We have to have some kind of a vision some reason to move forward. Because if, like, if I didn't think that I was going to have business for another year and a half, really, why get up? (laughs) You know, I might as well just go take a big long nap or just, just hang out, you know, but I get up, I go, I go for my run, I get dressed, I take a shower, I get out of my pajamas. And, you know, I, I just have to, I have to prepare for the best, you know, I have to, I I have different kind of scenarios that I'm working on, like what, what happens if this, what, how will I respond if this happens? How will I respond if this happens? So, and I, and I think that's a lesson for all of us. And I'm not, I'm not making it up. I'm taking this from other people's, you know, suggestions and kind of what other people are doing too and things that I've read. But I think it's a really good life lesson of we just have to think about different possibilities and then be prepared for those. So I have to have hope that things are going to turn back to normal. You know, like I started this business in the recession in 2007, 2008. But at the time, I didn't know it was a recession. I was in the middle of it. You know, that's how it happens, right? We're in the middle of something and we don't really know what's going on. But I started this business and then just things were slow to begin with, with, you know, for good reason, you know, just like gradually picked up and I built that, built a community, you know, just slowly. And I just feel like I have to do the same thing, just kind of almost starting, starting back with just connecting with people in a different way, like this way. And just move forward knowing, having faith and having that optimism that things will change down the road. But that's what I do with the races. That's what I do with the running. Because if things opened up magically tomorrow and they said, you got to go run a marathon next week, I got to be ready for that. And if I wake up tomorrow and they say, we're going to have mass vaccinations in another month and travel's going to resume, I have to be ready for that. You know, I can't just be sitting on my butt going, Oh gosh, I'm surprised. What am I going to do now? No, we just, we all got to be prepared for that. That's a good point. When you're in doing that analogy to the race, I think that's, that's really good. Um, And are you thinking these trips that you've got planned and you think are a go soon, or even the ones that you're hoping for, do you feel when you get there, 
that the places that you regularly go, the things that you go visit, do you feel that most of them are going to be afloat and that will be, or you may, or you might have to just on make some changes as to did they make it over? Are the still businesses in Morocco still accepting you? Are their attractions still ready? And do you have a feel of that right now, even of what is happening at the other end? No, I don't. I don't really know this far out how that might play yeah. out. I, I do know. I'll give you one example. So when we do the Seattle Culinary Tour. We do the Ride the Ducks, which is just a lot of fun, right? right. And they're out of business. The Seattle, Seattle Ride the Ducks is now out of business. So that's just something that we can't do. In terms of Morocco, and Teresa actually asked me this on, a, on just a, our weekly call that we had, um, just kind of how things might change with the tours in the future. I think one, if we go to a mosque, they are going to have things that are built in to protect people. Like there will only be a certain number of people allowed in at a time. Right. And maybe you yeah. have to wear a mask or maybe you don't. It's just going to depend. It's Like I said, it's, it's just too far out to tell at this point. Yeah. Um, but going to a market that's filled with a ton of people, thousands of people, that might be out of the question um, right. until a later date. So there will be you know, there may be changes to future tours, but it's just, so, it's too soon to tell at this point. Yeah, right. Yeah, that makes sense. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good question. I was, I was just asked just to kind of go a little bit further on that question about um, if people get stuck at a particular destination, that just further to Mark's question, you know, Teresa and I would be here. If anybody's ever had a missed flight or anything, you know that Teresa's on the ball <laughs> and helping uh, in the background and kind of tracking flights and making sure that everything's running smoothly for everybody. If that was the case, if people got stuck, you know, we would do whatever we could on our end if it was on one of our tours to help people get out. You know, we're here in the office. If I'm on the trip, Teresa's in the office and we're helping people with that and trying to make connections, you know, and just in terms of embassies and that sort of thing. So, okay, back to questions. Regarding travel insurance, because this has come up a couple of times, travel insurance should always be purchased at the time of booking a tour or booking a trip or booking a flight. And it's going to depend on the travel insurance provider where, whether they will actually honor an insurance policy after the fact. Like they usually give you, it might be a week or two. So you've booked a tour and then you might have a week or two to actually purchase the travel insurance package. The idea is that they don't want you to book a trip, break your leg, buy the insurance, and then say, whoops, I broke my leg. Now I want my, you know, I want this covered. So always, always uh, purchase travel insurance as soon as you book a trip. If you need to chat with Teresa or I about that at all, if you have any issues or any second thoughts about booking insurance at this point, and you've already booked a tour, reach out to us separately or privately offline, and we'll see if there's anything that we can do to help you through that process. Hey, Beth. Um, yeah. So real quick, um, what constitutes booking a tour? Just putting it down a deposit? Yeah, putting down a deposit. Or, okay. So no. deposit, not payoff. Just, just curious. Correct. It's so it's, I think it's as soon as you sign up for a trip. So signing okay. up, maybe not the registration form, but more designating <sighs> that uh, with a deposit. Okay. Yeah, I have gotten travel insurance shortly after I booked the flight, even if that was like a few weeks or a month after the initial deposit, shortly after part of my payment when I was just doing that. So they, they, did they check into that? Did they require you to send the flight? When I did that, I had basically sent them all of the booking information for all the pieces that I had done. And like the most recent thing was just like a couple of days before, but a couple of them had been further in the a little bit further in the past. Okay. Good to know. That may, that may vary wildly from company to company as well. Yeah. Very, yeah. Very much so. You don't know. Somebody had asked on a previous, on the previous call, and I just thought it was a good question just to kind of speculate uh, a little bit. She had asked about how we might structure our tours in the future. And I think, Deb, that this kind of riffs off of that a little bit too about whether we make any changes. I think 
the thing that I would be most kind of hopeful about and something that I would, that I do hope would come to fruition down the road. And I know like my, my Morocco folks have talked about in Europe, they are considering this health passport, which would be like uh, the way I envisioned it would be this yellow health card. Um, so it would actually show that you have a vaccination or that you have the anti, you've had an antibody test. And I think that in a kind of in a perfect world down the road, that that might be something that we could rely on, that you can't go on a tour unless you show proof of this kind of a thing. And, I, and it seems like that would make everybody feel more comfortable. It would make the other tour participants feel more comfortable. It would, be, it would make everybody on the ground feel more comfortable as well. And, uh, and that's the kind of thing that I hope for, you know, kind of across the board. But that's just my speculation and my wish. I just, what I think today may not be what I think next week. You know, there might be new information that comes out that would be different or give us different kind of hope at least. So, but that's kind of what, that's what I think. So, okay. Teresa just sent me a note just to remind me of something. And and Teresa, I'm totally fine if you want to jump in and and give your feedback too. I don't mind, but she's letting, she's leaving it to me, which is really nice. She's making me look smart. She mentioned that evacuation insurance, she clarified evacuation insurance is different than regular travel insurance. Evacuation insurance, it's, uh, I get a yearly policy and usually I remember to do it like on the way to the airport when I'm going to Papua New Guinea because it, it always renews in August. And I'm like, oh my God, that's right. I have to get my, my travel and ins- my evacuation insurance. So evacuation insurance, you can technically get up until the day that you leave on a trip. But travel insurance is the one that's going to cover like your luggage, your canceled flights, illness, that sort of thing. That is the one that you need to get in advance and evacuation insurance you can get at the last minute. So thank you, Teresa, for for that clarification. Are there any other questions at this point, Rachel? Yeah, I'm curious um, with your, I guess, peers, other other tour and and trip leaders, because I think everyone knows what travel was like. They can remember what it was like kind of pre-9-11. And just anticipating how how this pandemic is really going to change the nature of travel as we know it. And I know it's no one has a crystal ball. We don't really know what to anticipate. But I was curious if if you all are discussing anything in terms of how this is going to shift kind of the broader like worldview of how people travel internationally. Yeah, I actually, I'm on a phone call every week with uh, my colleagues in the tour industry. And um, these are people who have companies that range from, that are more boutique, like small, like Wander Tours, to much larger companies that are seeing three to 500 people a year kind of come come through their doors, go, go on tours with them. So I, I do try to tap into what kind of that thinking, what everyone's talking about. I think most immediately people are thinking that people are going to want to stay closer to home and not do the international travel. They're going to be a little bit concerned about getting on planes. So they may stick you know, stick to home, you know, home base for a little while and do more natural stuff. Like we're all so cooped up at this point that, that getting out into nature, you know, is, is probably going to be big, like this summer, you know, most immediately this summer, people are going to really be thinking, thinking in terms of that. I'm going to say too, that the people on this call are, are going to skew that demographic because you're going to, you're more adventurous than most people. Although I would bet that at the first chance you get, you're going to be out hiking, whether you've ever hiked before or not. So you're probably going to want to get out uh, into the woods and, and really just enjoy some fresh air. But I think broad strokes, I think that, I think people are kind mm-hmm. of gearing up for that, you know, to a certain degree. And I've heard people say, you know, that it's, it's going to take years for, you know, the airlines to recover and to kind of get back up to what they had, you know, where they were 10 years ago. It's going to be a really long recovery. Certainly, you know, with 9-11, it was a short-term event that was still pretty devastating, right? And we're looking at this event that just has like an unknown end date. Just thinking of the capacity level and the, the, the percentage, the small percentage of flights that are happening right now, 
Um, and then that, you know, the hotels, whether if they're even open, they're running at, you know, 10, 20% capacity, just, you know, really low capacity right now. So it's probably not going to be good, you know, just to, like for people on the ground, you know, for those hotels and for those guides and for those tour operators and those small companies who are running businesses, it's going to be pretty dire. It's going to be really hard. There, and there might be some consolidation that happens, you know, with that. Um, there might be some interesting opportunities that arise uh, with that. The people that I talk to, financially, they are, they are in a much more difficult place than I am. And I think it's, it's one thing is it's probably hard for them to see the light because they are just scrambling right now to get themselves out of debt. Because like I said, that scenario where they have paid for, you know, their services and now their people are canceling and they want their money back and they're kind of stuck in a hole. So they're, they're having a really difficult time. So they may not be seeing so many possibilities, but I, I see it as a, and, and there is also within that, I will say that there's a lot of optimism of this is a time for us to pause and to think about how, the future of travel is going to look, right? Because we see clear skies now. We, I mean, literally, we're seeing clear skies. This is an opportunity for us to, to consider how we're changing the environment with our travel decisions, you know, and how can we make better decisions, you know, down the road. I don't know. Everything's speculation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's the thing is that it's just all speculation at this point. But it's good you know, having said that, it's still good to talk it through. And I appreciate having the outlet. I appreciate having other people to talk with it about. And hopefully you're getting something out of it as well, just being able to to kind of hear other things. And did I, I might have missed you before. Did you have a question earlier? I didn't want to. do. And being in healthcare, like people ask, like, when is things going to return to normal and the whole vaccine thing and everything? So I understand this probably is asking a lot of you to say, like, how far out will you decide what say Morocco because I'm thinking about myself like when we would decide if we were going and Teresa I believe this is all your fault because I saw the email that said it's time to start looking at flights and of course I'm a last minute person so I was like yeah, yeah whatever and then all of a sudden like everything crashed with like no travel so I blame a lot of people <laughs> I knew, but just kidding. Um, so I know it's it's like you just like we can't tell when things are going to happen in healthcare. You can't tell, but I was just wondering, like, do you have any idea how far out you'll make your decision? No, at this point, I don't. I will say that I made the decision about Papua New Guinea further out because of the unique situation there. Because right. we go to a big gathering where there's thousands of people from tribes from all over the country with no immunity system, right? So no immune system. And there, I mean, we specifically go to go to big events. So, and there's just no avoiding it. So I just felt like it was, I really felt like it was the right thing to do. In terms of Morocco, and I said this on the last call as well, and, I, that, and I'm repeating it because people seem to be a bit relieved by that, is that I will not take final payments on tours until I know for sure whether it's going to be a go or not. So if it comes down to me having to pay our, like my operator in Morocco, and I'm still not confident with, with a decision, like I just, like things are just still too unstable at that point, I will either push them off a little, you know, to as much you as I can, the or then I would make a decision to cancel it. If it was an absolute must and they said, you have to make a decision today, I would err on the side of caution and not run the tour for everyone's safety on the tour, as well as the safety of the people in Morocco. Um, but I, I think the best that I can say is that I won't ask for any other money from people until until we know for sure whether it's going to go or not and and just because information comes out you know just on a on a daily basis you know just mm -hmm. like so much speculation too you know it's speculation on the on the media's part it's speculation on the CDC's part you know you know until things kind of stabilize i just won't I just won't know is that an okay answer for you ann i wish you could say no we're going oh, yeah. <laughs> but obviously um, you know, it, it is, it's a great answer because it's, it's honest. And th yeah. I thank you for that. Hi, I'm just popping in here to tell you that this is where I got disconnected. So we had to backtrack a little bit on the conversation as you will now hear. 
So, so Katie, maybe repeat your question. Oh, yeah, I said, because I, I have not done a tour with you. I was just curious, because I normally do not do tours, and I'm doing it because this PNG is unique. What is your minimum and maximum of for the group? Oh, normally? it depends. Yeah, it depends on the destination. So because I bring a smaller group to Papua New Guinea, it's a smaller number of people that's required. I'd have to I'd have to literally go back to my numbers and, and take a look to see what it is. Mm-hmm. It could be as low as six or seven on that. You know, it depends. Usually it's eight people for okay. like Morocco. Just off the top of my head, I'm going to say it might be eight people. But PNG, because I take fewer people, it's a, it's a smaller, smaller number. Okay, that's good. Um, and then, and Anne, I will tell you that you, I, I'm sure the, the problem was on my end because I got kicked off myself, but I didn't hear a lot of what you had said. So I don't know if you want to repeat that. Well, you, you said, is that a good answer? That was kind of, okay. yeah. And I said, I think it was like the best answer given the circumstances, because I said, what I would like is the answer to be like, yes, we are going definitely. Right. But, you, you know, I, we know it can't be. So, um. I'm just going to keep, like you said, keep hope, keep hoping. I've never, it's odd. Like I've never taken travel insurance in all the places I've gone. Mm-hmm. Now I'll have to think about that. Yeah. That's a, yeah. There's another stock to buy. <laughs> yeah. And then the other thing I like, I mean, I went to Tanzania and didn't take any vaccination. I just, it's just not my thing. Yeah. Um, you know, this is making me rethink a lot of that. So yeah. And I'm, I'm very similar to you because as much as I travel, I have never had insurance. I would do it for this just because, especially when you're a tour group. And I, I, because I am a shot, very phobic of shots, I only do it if, it, if it's mandatory. So I've never done it. And knock on wood, I've, I've been um, safe and I've never gotten sick. And for me, I, you know, I know Beth knows when, she, when I saw her email that she was canceling the P&G, for me, it was like, oh my gosh, because this is every year I do a birthday trip. And even though my birthday is in September, this was going to be my birthday trip. So now I'm like, what the heck am I going to do now for my birthday? So <laughs> that's my dilemma now. I got to figure out. <laughs> Come to Seattle. <laughs> Not as exotic, but. Uh, I know. <laughs> yeah. Okay. yeah. Well, when, when I went to Bhutan, it's one of, one of my first big intercontinental trips. And the one couple had to cancel like the week before the trip because one of them broke a leg mountain biking and just had to eat the whole cost of a trip to Bhutan, which is expensive. Ooh. Ooh. Um, so that, that was sort of my lesson in, yeah, maybe this is a good idea. (laughs) Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We've seen that ourselves. We've seen a lot of, you know, we've seen last minute cancellations. Actually, somebody who went to PNG did the very same thing, broke his leg, um, while he was biking and, uh, couldn't make it. Not this year, a few years ago. So, Mm -hmm. Hey, uh, Joe, are you there? I want to ask you something. You had sent me a question and I was, I'm not sure that I understand it, but I wanted to get some clarification on it. So you said your sister works in corporate agency travel and said that corporations must adhere to essential travel guidelines. And you are asking whether does leisure travel have the same restrictions? And do you mean that essential travel guidelines, that this is something that's right now, you mean like during the virus outbreak? Yeah, so her job was to reach out to, let's say Sotheby's, Heineken, and Baker of Lysol, for example. And the guidelines for employees was that um, Heineken said, you know, our culture is for face-to-face meetings, so we plan to travel as quickly as we can. I see. On the other hand, some companies are saying, no, there's only essential travel. There's Everything's a Zoom meeting. And my add-on question was, a lot of leisure and business travel is mixed through conventions that are scheduled two, three, four, five years out in locations. Listen to you talk. Do they get their month? They say, I'm three years from now, we're going to be in New Orleans. Can I address that? Because I work for the Walt Disney Company. And in my job, um, I travel 85% of my role. And we are only, um, right now I'm furloughed. Um, but uh, we, only those who were still remaining had essential travel if they could travel. We have companies, we have clients who've had scheduled conventions and I work for Disney Institute so I do programming and consulting all over the world so they're saying hey we're supposed to be here in June we're now going to be next year so everyone is postponing we've had minimal cancellations we've had postponements so that's been the major thing because everything right now at Disney all our resorts everything is closed our convention center just in in Orlando is closed so people are saying right now we know maybe 2020 is a done deal 
but we're maybe going to move things around to 21 or whatever it might be. So people are anxious to, to do what they have to do, but they just have to find the flexibility excuse me, the flexibility to try to figure out where they can uh, do it in a future date. So if you have to rotate through New York, New Orleans, L.A., Chicago, or the Disney Institute, you as the travel manager will try not to, you don't want to incur a cancellation fee, but you may postpone. Yeah, everyone's postponed. Yeah, another year. Everything's postponed. For my, my whole thing, right before, we, before the pandemic, I was supposed to be in Asia and in Australia for three months. All those things have now slid till the end of the year. Whether we'll be able to do it, we don't know yet. So they said, right now we know we can't do June and whatnot, so we'll, we'll just wait. So we, we're, we're on hold because my job is all upfront uh, facilitation and talking with people. We have done Zoom things where we can, but that's not what we do. So we're going to figure out what, we, what it will look like for us because it probably will be uh, less people in our, in our rooms and programs. Who knows why? We don't know. Did Disney come up with an opening date? No, no, none of us have. No, no, none of the parks. In San Diego, where I am, there's SeaWorld and the zoo. And I just wondered if anybody has heard opening anything. Yeah. I think part of that just has to do with the governors, right? Like it's that, like that when your question, Joe, to go back to that about like kind of the leisure travel, I don't, I don't think as an industry, there is, uh, there are guidelines. I think that we are all paying attention to what, it, it, in some cases, we're paying attention to our governors and kind of what is possible and responsible. Like we are in a phased approach here in Washington state where it's only essential travel right now. And then they're going to start, I think it's, it might even be phase three that they open up the travel you know, just non-essential travel. So we've got some time before we can actually do that. And I'll say yes and to that because yes, it's the governor, but here um, we have phase one and phase two, but the governor is actually listening to Disney because they're saying we have, they're far more ahead and more uh, innovative and more proactive than what the governor was thinking about. So Disney will do it on their own versus we're looking for the governor because the governor, to be honest, wanted to open early. So not in all states because we don't have a governor that has a lot of sense over here. So that's another story. Yeah. Well, and and we're lucky that I think that our governor is, you know, he's got a, a planned, slow approach. Mm-hmm. So he's, I mean, he's being questioned on in some ways, but it's not, he's not acting irrationally. So, oh, yeah. you know, yeah. so people are, are paying attention. As we, I just want to be respectful of your times and your locations because I know it's late for you folks on the East Coast and it's, nearing dinner time for the folks on the West Coast. Are there any other questions that you have right now? Beth, I was just wondering, just out of curiosity, when is this trip to Morocco that you're still hoping might be a go? <laughs> Are you, October? Do you want me to, you want me to see if there's space, Deb? Is it October? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> October. So I, yeah, so I, there's actually several. So there's, I had so many people interested in Morocco that I had this February trip that we just did was an add-on, was a bonus trip that for people who could make it came. And I went with a small group. There were eight of us on that trip. So lucky because we went and it was solid. And as we left, people were wearing masks at the airport. And we thought, you people are weird. Like, what is going yes. on here? Because we had no idea. Yes. Right. So October 2020 is the next one. February 2021 is after that. And then I'm working on dates for fall 2021. But I can't I can't, I just can't get answers right now because everything's closed, like in terms of the hotels and kind of lining all that up. And then I will probably have enough people to do another one in 2022. I just can't, you know, can't think quite that far. No, I don't think anybody wants to think that. I think that hurts your brain to think that's not <laughs> that yeah. far out. So yeah, there's, there's, uh, but they're, they're women only. You have to leave Ted at home. That'd be just fine. Okay. Yeah, I remember when the newsletter had the teaser, I sent the emails like, what are the odds? I don't think so. Yep. Yep. <laughs> Sorry, Mark. I, I'd be okay. We just did two and a half months in South America together. I'm ready for a woman only, let me tell you. <laughs> oh, good, good, good. Any October. other questions? Beth, what about your domestic travel plans? Are you, you thought any of those through? or Do you mean my tours or my personal travel? Mm-hmm. 
No, your tours. I mean, when you talk about people, not this group necessarily, but international travel might be some hesitance. Are you, have you going to do Santa Fe or any other? Yeah, I'm working on that. So the New Orleans trip is actually posted on the website right now. All of the tours are on the website at the moment, but I've taken the registration. There's no ability to send in a deposit at this point. And I'm still working in the background. I'm working on a Seattle culinary tour and a Santa Fe culinary tour, just having a hard time getting confirmations on that. And, and frankly, you know, like the restaurants here in Seattle, as they are in many other places, are just devastated. So I'm not even sure. I think any itinerary that I create that includes restaurants and maybe even hotels, I have to be really clear that there could be changes. I wouldn't, probably wouldn't change the price of it. I I would still try to honor that price. But that's the issue at this point is that, you know, the hotels, you know, in the Seattle area are just shut down and uh, it's hard to get a hold of anybody. Mm. So, um, but I am working on that and I'm thinking about other opportunities. I am thinking about, let's say, hiking in the Pacific Northwest. Or I, I mentioned this on the on the previous call that I had with people that I work with a woman. I don't work with her. I, I'm friends with a woman who's a running coach, and she helps people get from couch to 5K. And we've talked about collaborating and put, putting together a destination event where she coaches people through a running program, and then we go to Hawaii, and then we go run a 5K or a 10K or a half marathon or a marathon and, um, and kind of get people on board kind of in, in that fashion. So that's in the back of my mind as well and kind of how that might play out. Always Thank thinking. you. Okay. Always thinking. <laughs> All right. Well, I'll look on the website. <laughs> okay. Right. Yeah, sure. Hey, if there's, uh, if there's no other questions, we'll, um, we can kind of shut it down if you want. I'm always available. Teresa's always available via email if you want to send anything off to us or you have any questions or you just want to ask us something <laughs> privately, you can certainly do that. Everybody good? I sit by my computer waiting for your emails. <laughs> All right. It was nice meeting everybody. Good night. Oh, yeah, good to see everybody. Bye. Thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, Bye, thanks for joining. Great to see you. Hopefully you found that helpful. I, I know it's just a lot of speculation at this point, but sometimes it's good to hear what questions other people are raising and to hear answers, even if they are just a stab in the dark at this point. If you enjoy what you hear and you'd like to support the show, there are a number of ways you can do so. I'd first encourage you to go to patreon.com slash be bold and join our community there. A donation of just five bucks a month gets you some lovely benefits, including the ability to submit questions for me to ask guests and you get access to bonus content, including questions I ask of the guests that only get shared with Patreon supporters. You'll also be able to join our private Facebook group and that is ladies only. But there are other ways you can support the show. Make sure you're subscribed in your podcast app. That actually helps bump the show up in search results so others can find me. So please do that. And please also share this episode with a couple of friends. The number one way people find out about podcasts is word of mouth. So if you do enjoy these episodes, that's a fantastic way to show your support. To keep up with me in all of my travels, well, I guess when I'm traveling (laughs) and my running, which I am doing quite a bit of right now, you can connect with me by friending me on Facebook. And I'm on Instagram at both Beth Witwa and Wandergal. So it's uh, B-E-T-H-W-H-I-T-W-A and Wandergal. You can find links to everything uh, in the show notes at she'sboldpodcast.com slash episodes. Ladies, don't forget to join the Be Bold Facebook group at facebook.com slash groups slash Be Bold group for support and encouragement for whatever ways you're trying to be bold. Thanks for joining me for another episode of the She's Bold podcast. And until next time, be bold.